I went past the field of a sluggard, past the vineyard of someone who has no sense. Thorns had come up everywhere, the ground was covered with weeds, and the stone wall was in ruins. I applied my heart to what I observed and learned the lesson from what I saw. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a thief, and scarcity like an armed man. How y'all doing today? Well, we're continuing in our series on the book of Proverbs, and today our topic's really looking at work in regards to our relationships and how important that is. And so I can't think of a better person to come and share a message with us on work than Pastor Steve Young. And for many of you, you know Pastor Steve. Pastor Steve actually leads our military ministry. He's been doing so since 2012, and Pastor Steve does that part-time because he works full-time up at the Presidio of Monterey on the Garrison Command Staff as one of our government civilians up there. Now, many of you also know that Steve's a retired U.S. Army chaplain. Steve served for over 31 years in our military, and he's held positions at the highest level of command. Yes, amen, yeah. We celebrate that. We celebrate. And Steve, in his unique assignments, a couple of those really of note. One is Steve was the broadcast chaplain for Armed Forces Network. And Armed Forces Network, for those of you in the military know, it reaches over 54 countries, and it really impacts the lives of those who are deployed, family members, service members, civilians, all who are deployed around the world. And Steve was the voice of Armed Forces Network. Isn't that amazing as our broadcast chaplain? Also, Steve was instrumental in working for many of the initiatives through the Army Chief of Chaplains Office. In fact, Steve was the chief uh, speechwriter for the Army Chief of Chaplains in the Pentagon. So what that means is all those great speeches that our chaplains gave, this is the guy that did all the work behind the scenes, amen? And then finally, really, I think, a, a powerful testimony to Steve's faithfulness and his service to our nation and to the gospel of Jesus Christ is Steve actually, when he retired in 2007, he became the chaplain for Operation Worship. And one of the initiatives that Steve launched in his leadership role was this right here. Steve was instrumental in putting camouflage on the cover of the Bible. Amen? He put camo on the Bible before camo was cool. But what's really neat is actually Steve wrote the introduction of this actual Bible, which many of you who are in this room, like me, perhaps were blessed with receiving this when you were deployed overseas in combat zones. And Steve wrote these words, it is our prayer that the contents of this book will feed your soul, enrich your heart, and broaden your understanding of relationships with your fellow man and with your Father in heaven who loves you beyond compare. Words of encouragement that every service member across our world received, family members, civilians. And so Steve Young, a man of faithful tireless servant of Jesus Christ. So let's pray for Steve, and after we do that, we'll go ahead and welcome Steve. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this wonderful man. We thank you for his life, a testimony to your goodness and your faithfulness. And now today, Lord, as he brings this message, the importance of work, Lord Jesus, we pray that our hearts will be stirred, our minds will be focused, and our lives will be transformed by the words that you put on his heart as we open our ears and open our hearts to the truth of your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 Would you welcome Steve? (laughs) Thank you. Sean, thank you for your very kind words. Good morning. How are y'all doing? So good to see you in church today. We're going to continue our uh, series on wisdom for healthy relationships out of the book of Proverbs. And uh, Pastor Sean, you remember, spoke two weeks ago about sexuality and how we should guard that very precious um, identity that we all have in relationship. And then last week, Pastor Dennis talked about the importance of controlling our speech. Remember that? Wasn't that wonderful? And just a great, great wisdom from both of those pastors. Today, we're going to be talking about working hard and hard work being the backbone of healthy relationships. Hard work being the backbone 
of healthy relationships. There's a couple of general comments about the book of Proverbs. One, uh, you've heard us use the symbols of guardrails and guideposts. Guardrails uh, out, out on the outer, out on the um, outer edge, and those guardrails keep us from veering off and getting in a big, big trouble, don't they? And then the guideposts, you know, whether it be a caution ahead or or slow or speed up, you know, those guideposts tell us that you're on the right track and things are going to be safe if you continue this way. Um, let me make a comment about the authorship of Proverbs. Solomon, on three occasions in very important junctures throughout Proverbs, identifies himself as the author of the book of Proverbs. In chapter 1, verse 1, chapter 10, verse 1, and chapter 25, verse 1, Solomon says, these are the book of Proverbs, the wise sayings of Solomon. There is a pocket of saying, the sayings of the wise, in chapters 22 to 24, there are 30 of them, and Solomon, again, was the compriser of those 30 wise sayings. Now, there are two other authors in the book of Proverbs, one in chapter 30. He's Agar, the son of Jacob, and he wrote chapter 30. And then King Lemuel wrote Proverbs chapter 31, and we'll look into some of his words later today. But mainly, of course, we'll look at Solomon's writings, chapters 1 through 29. Then we've also learned that Proverbs compares and contrasts the wise person to several categories of people, one being the youth. The other, how is the wise contrasted compared to the simple person? And then you see a third, how about mockers? How is the wise person compared to and contrasted to the fool? And today we're going to be looking at the bottom of the list there. How is the wise person contrasted and talked about in comparison to the way of the sluggard? Mentioned 14 times in the book of Proverbs. As you see, they're translated in today's language as laziness. So how does the book of Proverbs, the wise person, contrast himself or herself to um, one who is lazy? One who is lazy where pretty much nothing really matters. Nothing's worth breaking a sweat over. (laughs) Nothing's worth getting all riled up for. (laughs) Why take the big risk if we don't have to? And on and on and on the list goes, right? The lazy person. So today we're going to compare the benefits of the hardworking and the not so much benefits of the lazy person and the relationships that are affected by both. So if you have your Bible or if you have one of your apps, of course, follow along in the scriptures and let's take a look and jump into the book of Proverbs. We'll open up with chapter 24, verses 20 to 30 to 34. These are the verses we saw before we came up here on on the platform this morning. Solomon here is making an assessment, and he writes these words. He said, I went past the field of the sluggard, past the vineyard of someone who has no sense. Thorns had come up everywhere. The ground was covered with weeds, and the stone was in ruins. I applied my heart to what I observed, and I learned a lesson from what I saw, a little sleep a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a thief, and scarcity like an armed man. So Solomon's first observation, the way of laziness, or the way of the sluggard is, laziness can overtake us unaware. It creeps up on us without us even knowing about it over time. And the effects are very slow forming. Look what he says here in the scriptures. I went past the field of the sluggard, past the vineyard of someone who has no sense. Thorns had come up everywhere. The ground was covered with weeds and the stone wall was in ruins. As I was beginning to develop this message, I, I mentioned to my wife, Anne, I said, sweetheart, look at this first verse. And we both started chuckling, laughing, chuckling, laughter, thing. oh, it reminds us of our backyard. <laughs> we brought a picture of it here for you. Yeah, the weeds are going up. <laughs> yeah, the stone walls. So you thought we all had it all together. <laughs> it's not the case. But that's not actually our backyard. (laughs) But you get the idea. I didn't want to put it up there because of all the neighbors. They would uh, be very concerned. Yeah. Why bring down the rental values if you don't have to? (laughs) But laziness over time allows our circumstances and our condition to overtake us. And again, we don't even hardly see it coming. But it's the erosion of time that takes place. And when laziness takes its course... We almost become desensitized and a little bit numb to what's happening to us. And you see here the outcome, a little bit of sleep, a little bit of slumber, a little bit of folding of the hands to rest. And 
Poverty will come on you like a thief and scarcity like an armed man. Solomon talks of poverty, poverty and scarcity. And God is extending to us a, a, um, a guardrail, a warning. So be careful for the way of the sluggard and be mindful of the slow creep that can come upon you when it comes to being sluggish or lazy. If you're taking notes, the way of the slugger, laziness overtakes us unaware. The effects are slow forming and over time become deeply entrenched. Short seasons become a lifestyle. Short seasons can become a lifestyle. Let's look at chapter 20, verse 4. Solomon writes, sluggards do not plow in season, so at harvest time they look, but they find nothing. So here's another guardrail, a warning. God says, be mindful of this mentality that is having low input with high expectations. Low input with high expectations. And this is the person where Paul said, I mean, where Solomon says, they do not plow in season. For some reason, in their mind, they do not forecast, they do not imagine or envision that if I want to reap a great harvest in the future, that I must be willing to maybe put in the hard work right now. And for them, those two don't connect. And for some reason, with inside them, they reason that the cost is too high, it is not worth my investment, and probably wouldn't work out anyway. It's those kinds of things. And this is the individual that really, there are two aspects of, of the characteristics of, of a person like this. One is, they never want to get started with anything. A good idea comes along, there could be two or three people, a family member, friends, coworkers. Great idea, you guys have fun, <laughs> right? I'm not going to invest my time, or invest my energy, or invest my, you know, abilities and talents. The other person is, you get a group of people come along, good idea, yeah, yeah, I love it. Jumps in, but again, because of this characteristic of being sluggish and lazy. They don't carry things through. They, they go part way and then they end up quitting and pulling out and stopping, thinking, oh, well, I've done enough, right? And Paul says, these are the people who do not plow in season, but yet look what happens. They hope for positive results, so at harvest time they look and they calculate, even though I didn't put 100% in, even though maybe I didn't start or I didn't finish, they calculate that by some means, some way, some reason, I can expect good results. And yet, at the same time, look, look at Solomon says, but generally speaking, they might get lucky once in a while, but generally speaking, they find nothing. They find nothing. So the impact of a non-starter or someone who gets involved and quits too early, and when that cycle begins to happen all, all, you know, over and over again, and then they have that low input and high expectation, they begin to build a cycle within their mind, within their um, characteristics, within their environment of uh, disillusionment, and despair, and disappointment. And that's usually how it all goes time and time again. Let's take a couple of examples very briefly, and your imagination can, can take it to the other levels. But say, for example, a football coach who grows a little bit lazy in his or her duties, and they don't study the other team's you know, good football game skills and their best plays, their talent. And then on the other side of the coin, they don't you know, have their own team as disciplined as they need to be. And you can imagine the impact of that, right? All of a sudden, the L's begin to go up, the losses, and the W's begin to come down because you can't put both in the same category, the same game, same week. And next thing you know, everybody said, how did we lose that game? And uh, next thing you know, you're kind of puzzled and confused and a little bit of uh, hurt. And sometimes people point fingers, well, if you had made that play or if you thought about this, yeah, just a little bit of laziness can go a long ways. What about an office worker who in his or her emails and communications gets a little bit lax in the performance and you know, duties. And there's a lot of emails that aren't read, very important emails, processes and products and things that have to be taken care of get delayed because of that. What about a student who is working on a big project? And you may have been there, I've been there many times. And instead of doing a term paper two months out, we wait till five days before, and then I said, oh, I better get to do my term paper. We spend the next 48 hours <laughs> working hard, right? Spending up all night. And uh, that's not good <laughs> because a lot of bad consequences. We stay up all night, we work hard, learning goes down a little bit probably, and sometimes the grade suffers a bit, right? <laughs> yes, indeed. So if you're taking notes, if I want to reap harvest in the future, I must be willing to do things now, do things right, and work hard now. 
I want to harvest in the future, do things right, work hard now, most often the case. Next, um, 1519, Proverbs 1519. And uh, I like this verse in the sense of its imagery and so on. But Solomon wrote these words. He said, the way of the sluggard is blocked with thorns, but the path of the upright is like a highway. Let me talk about the back half of that verse first. Thinking about the path of an upright person. The upright, wise person understands God's ways, God's wisdom, and finds practicality in them, puts them into use, right? That's what wisdom is. Understanding God's method, his mentality, putting them into practice in our lives. The wise person who does that, Solomon says their pathway is like a highway, right? And uh, when I think about that, getting on a highway, I love to get in a car just like you do. And I think I've got a beautiful highway before me, uncluttered and safe and attractive and easy gone. You know, you flip your arm up, you grab a bag of chips, you get a Coke, you turn the Christian music radio station on. And you're thinking, oh, it's so good, isn't it? <laughs> I just love it. <laughs> you take that nice, beautiful drive. But the first part of this verse, Solomon says, but the pathway of the sluggard is a pathway that's blocked with thorns. There is one complication, and it compounds into another complication, and it leads to another difficulty, and the list goes on and on and on. And these complications, they become both the expectation, the norm, and the outcome, um, as you could imagine. Consequently, when opportunities come along, this kind of a person, they don't see it as a good thing. They see it as a not so good thing. They pass up opportunities because they see the negative instead of the positive, right? Oh, we shouldn't get involved in that for many, many reasons. And they don't spend any energy getting involved. And um, this is the person who has no vision, no leadership, no service and no motivation. The effect of those around them, because of this characteristic inside, it's like putting a glass bubble around us. <laughs> Everybody's bouncing off the top, and it's very hard to break through an environment like that. If you've been around a team of people, and you get one or two people that you know, drag it down, that's exactly what happens. It's hard to rise above it. And God says the way of the sluggard is blocked with thorns. There's always something that gets in the way. So seldom is this person ever viewed by coworkers or viewed by people around them, friends, as one who is an achiever, one who is an overcomer. And unfortunately, overcoming optimism and, and persistence are not the prevailing persuasions, unfortunately. So God says, here's a guardrail. <laughs> he said, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> saints of the world, <laughs> beloved of my church, Pull yourselves away from this ideal. Pull yourselves and get away from that kind of lifestyle because it will drag you down. So again, to our notes, the road of the sluggard or laziness is filled with thorns. Its pathway is not pleasurable or easy to travel. And the journey dramatically and adversely affects our loved ones, our friends, and our coworkers. So what do you do if you find yourself in the difficulty and the condition of laziness. Just a few practical steps. I'll run through these very quickly. One, I would ask you to realize that the Lord is with you. He is for you, never against you. Amen? <laughs> so the Lord wants to help you. He wants to help me. And he wants us passionately to succeed in life. Secondly, I would ask you to decide to change. I can admonish you from the platform here. Your families can... Uh, reason with you and plead with you and coerce you and pray for you and everybody else can around you say come on get with it get with it but ultimately you and I we as an individual we own that decision 100% no one else does it happens in the mind it happens in the heart it happens in the soul until we decide within ourselves to make that decision and nothing else is going to take place. But the great thing about owning that decision is once you make it, no one can take it from you, right? You can keep from it, but once you get going, who's going to strip you from that? Nobody will stop you. And that's the great thing about deciding to change. And then I'd say take the initiative. Lots of times we sit back and we wait for someone else to call us, text us, <laughs> invite us. And uh, be the first one to take your good idea and reach out a hand to someone. Say, what do you think of this idea? Let's get involved. And I would say start now. Procrastination is the associate, the companion, and the enabler of laziness. 
procrastination. If we wait, 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 wait all the time, um, that's just prolonging things and it's not, not healthy. Then ask someone to come alongside you, find a battle buddy. There's strength in numbers, strength in friendship, and strength in togetherness. Then lastly, this morning, achieve one step at a time and build, build from there. So nothing is more palatable to the um, satisfaction sensories than having success, building on success, building on success. So let's go ahead and turn our attention now to hard work and the effects it has upon those around us. Uh, before we get into these verses, let me just say that all of this is about a balanced lifestyle. I mean, you can work too hard, and I can work too hard and become way out of balance. And becoming a workaholic is not healthy either, amen? Because we can get our family situation in trouble or even our work situation in trouble. We can get in trouble if we work too hard. So it's all about balanced lifestyles. Um, let's begin by looking at Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. When God first created man, look what happened here. The Lord God took him and he put him in the Garden of Eden. Help me with the next words. <laughs> yeah. Adam, guess what? You're in this beautiful, sinless garden. <laughs> I'm going to put you in the middle of it and garden. <laughs> He's like, oh, Lord, this is great. <laughs> I'm going to enjoy it. And so, yeah, by the way, you got to work it and take care of it. <laughs> right? And gardeners know what I'm talking about. Work it and take care of it. So God established very on early that work was good and that we were to have a good, strong work ethic. And then six verses later, God creates Eve, and we're still in chapter two of Genesis. It's not until chapter three where Adam and Eve fall into sin and into disobedience, and that, of course, they, they take from the fruit of the, um, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So sin had not even entered the world yet, and God said to Adam, I'm going to put you in the garden, but Adam, remind you, <laughs> you have to do a little bit of work while you're there, right? Let's look at 1214 back in Proverbs. From the fruit of their lips, they're filled with good things, and the work of their hands brings them reward. There's nothing quite so satisfying that when you're out doing something, work with your hands, and the satisfaction one gets from that, oh, the, the satisfactions are almost innumerable and too many to count. So God here is giving not us a guardrail, but a guidepost now. He says, this is the kind of lifestyle I want you to have. This is my kind of plan I want to have for your life, to be productive, to accomplish, to become the person whom I've intended you to become, to reach and gain the level of your highest potential, your highest potential. And it is God's natural law of cause and effect when we work hard and achieve. And look at the scriptures say, and the work of their hands brings them reward. So what kind of reward do we gain? I get confidence and self-image and mental fitness and self-esteem. And when people around us and we're working hard, <laughs> who do they compliment? The person who's not working at all, who sits by and watches? Or do people around us compliment the one who's really working hard? People say, thank you so much for your hard work. And I like to drive by or if I'm in a situation, someone's taking care of me and bringing me something to drink or whatever, open the door for me or even much more than that. I like to say to them, thank you so much for your hard work. And the response that happens inside that individual, you can physically see it. They go, oh, it's my pleasure, Steve. I love to serve you and take care of you. It's my honor. It's my duty. And I'm thinking, thanks for your hard work. We gain respect from other people, and we have the reward of serving God as he intended us to serve him. So God here has given us a guidepost that he wants us to add hard work, gifts and talents and abilities um, to every opportunity and responsibility that comes our way. Let's go ahead and look at um, chapter 12, verse 11. Those who work their land will have abundant food. And those who chase fantasies, fantasies have no sense. So Solomon here is using the illustration of a landowner, a rancher, or a farmer. And um, so many of you work here in this beautiful agricultural industry in California, which is a $50 billion a year industry, some 350 different plant and animal commodities, and um, some 75,000 farms and ranches in California. So you folks who are in that industry... Um, you bring beautiful fruits and vegetables and nuts and oats and grains and, and from the vineyards, all the other produce as well. It's just a wonderful harvest that we enjoy. And for we who are not in the ag industry, I think it's fully appropriate here to apply our job, our occupation, um, uh, what we do for a living and um, how we live our lives in our homes. The, the principle here is we persistently, regularly, constantly apply diligence and hard work 
that we will have abundance in food and other commodities. You've been around people where it's been said to them, boy, I've never really been around someone who's worked that hard before. And um, when I say those words, um, I'm sure someone comes to mind for you. And uh, my uncles uh, often come to mind for me. I had six uncles who were all in construction, and construction works hard. <laughs> when I was in seminary, I worked with one of my uncles, Uncle Joe in Kansas City. We did concrete work. And I tell you, anytime you're working concrete, it's not easy work, right? So, um, and he had a stellar reputation for 45 years as a fine Christian company in, in um, uh, Kansas City. That was my Uncle Joe. The other uncles, all hardworking men as well. Another member that comes to mind in my family is my brother Richard, and Richard was a retired non-commissioned officer in the United States Army, served almost 20 years, and then he, came, he got out and he became a GS employee, worked civil service about five years, working in the commissary. So uh, after five years, he was able to say, <laughs> he didn't plan it this way, but he never took a day off, never called in sick one day, <laughs> and never missed a day of work, and through those five years was an exemplary employee for the agency. And the last job he had, he went to work for Pepsi. And my brother Richard was the guy who would go into the big warehouse stores like Costco or Walmart and those kinds of places. And these semi-trucks from Pepsi would pull up and they would unload all the goods out on the deck out there, the receiving piece. And my brother Dean would take the dolly and he'd take all these crates of pops and cans and chips and all these things and he'd have to wheel them all out there, rotate all the stock and get all the Pepsi products in there. So in eight hours, he'd have five different stores to go to. So I would call my brother Richard on occasion. And he would pick up the phone on many occasions. The answer that I got was, <sighs> I'm like, first I'm like, are you okay? <laughs> and then we'd talk for about 30 seconds. He goes, Steve, I can't talk right now, I'm too busy. All right, we'll talk later. And I have very distinct memories. Hard work, here he was in his 40s and 50s, had the shape of a 25-year-old, working, working, working. And um, a lot of you folks are like that. And um, you may be the person that I'm talking about, and if you are, my highest uh, commemoration to you for that. And uh, we need these kinds of folks. The Apostle Paul, he called himself a hardworking man when it came to the gospel. Look what he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, when he is defending his apostleship to the Corinthians, because people had some complaints about Paul. They should not have, but they did. And Paul, in defense, he says these, these words. He says, but by the grace of God, he said, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. He said, no, I worked harder than all of them. Who's he talking about? He was talking about all the other apostles. <laughs> so they were called of God, and they were there as was the beginning of Jesus' ministry and the baptism of John, all the way through his resurrection. They saw all of his miracles, and they were testimonies of that. But Paul says, oh, by the way, I'm called, <laughs> I'm called to be an apostle. I wasn't there with you, but nevertheless, the work that I do is because of the abundance of the grace that I have in God in my life. And Paul says, because of his goodness, because of his forgiveness, and all the other things about Paul's life, he said, I worked as hard as I could. Matter of fact, I worked harder than them all. And look at how he ends this verse. He says, Yet not I, but the grace of God that was in me. So here we see the other components in the equation. To get success, it's more than just hard work. It's God's grace. It's God's goodness. It's God's kindness. It's friends around us. It's the right circumstances, the right setting. And when all those begin to take place, something almost magical can happen, right? <laughs> success comes along. And this is what Paul was like. And of course, we have to be mindful of rest as well. What's the effects on other people when we have hard work? Well, it teaches those around us that nearly nothing's impossible if we put our mind and heart to it and God blesses it. It serves as a model for other people to follow. And others begin to believe if that person over there is working hard and doing well and becoming successful, maybe, just maybe, <laughs> by the grace of God, I too can get that kind of success. And this is where mentoring takes place and how these relationships are developed. A young person or a middle-aged person becomes a protege. They said, I want to select that person to teach me. And they asked him, can I learn about your business model? Can I learn about your processes? Can I learn about the way you do things so that I too can maybe be successful like you? And most of the times, often, they say, I'd love to teach you. And 
individuals like this, they become franchise players. We turn them into managers and supervisors and, and um, team captains, and they serve well because other people follow. If you're looking at your bulletin, hard work inspires others to achieve their highest potential. Last, we'll look at, um, let's look into chapter 31, The Virtuous Woman. And these words are very self-descriptive. Let's go through um, her characteristics in verse 15, 17, and 27. She gets up while it's still night, and she provides food for her family. She sets about her work vigorously, and she watches over the affairs of her household, verse 27, and does not eat the bread of idleness. And look at the results and the impact of the virtuous woman. Verse 23 and 28 and 31. Her husband is respected at the city gates. And her children arise and they call her blessed. And her husband also, he praises her. And then the last verse of the last chapter of the book of Proverbs, King Lemuel writes these words. Honor her for all that her hands have done and let her works bring her praise at the city gate. So here we find God honoring the characteristics that are spoken of in this woman in chapter 31, how it honors herself, her household, her community. And the virtuous, hardworking woman brings respect to her family, honor to her household, and admiration from her family. Let me just wrap up today with a thought from John chapter 10. Jesus is telling the parable of the good, um, good shepherd. In fact, in John chapter 10, verse 11, he said, I am the good shepherd. And he compares himself to the not so good shepherds, everybody else. <laughs> he said, I'm the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays his life down for his sheep. But the preceding verse, Jesus says something both very stark and, and also very comforting. He said, the enemy comes to seek, to, to destroy you and kill you. Seeks to destroy you and kill you. And uh, that's what the enemy does. They want to come still, kill, and destroy. And if the enemy can get us to quit striving, to help us fall short in our expectations and what we should achieve, if the enemy can somehow conjure us to become complacent or to be lethargic or to not fulfill the design whom God has called us to be, they've got a great foothold in the advancement of his principles. If the enemy can get us to become sluggish, the way of the sluggard, to become sluggish in our relationships with our marriage, our family, our friends, at work, in our relationship with God, becoming sluggish, then they begin to still kill and destroy, right? But thankfully, Jesus said, you don't have to think on that too long. He came and said, but guess what? I've come to give you life, and praise God, I've come to give you life abundantly. I've come to give you life and I've come to give you life in its fullest measure. So he doesn't want us to get sidelined and become sluggish. He said, this is the kind of person I want you to be, the design I have for your life. And if you'll follow along, he said, nothing will be able to stop us. I will cover you with my goodness. I'll bless you with my kindness. I'll anoint you by my spirit. I will lead you. I will encamp about you. And you'll imagine some of the greatest successes that would ever come into your, into your life. So God calls us to add hard work to the gifts, the talents, the abilities, the imagination, the creativity, the ingenuity, all that he's equipped us with. He said, add diligence to it, and when you do that, surprise, <laughs> goodness, blessing, honor, grace. It's all right there. But if I eject, <laughs> if you eject, not going to happen. But if we engage, lean on God for his grace, great things can happen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for really what we see in the Holy Scriptures as two sets of ideals and parameters. One is, on one side, it would bring great danger to us. But yet, once we're aware of the danger we're very mindful of the rescue mission that you've been on ever since we've been born, even before that. So you've called us to be close to you, and the secret is to follow you. 
And when we get sluggish in all of our ways, in any of our ways, whether it be with family, working, at the home, um, particularly in our relationship with you, will you just touch us by your spirit? Pull us out of it, Lord. Engage us to stay close to you. We will thank you for it and give you all the praise. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen.